Welcome to Wisdom Trek with Gramps. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, and we are on day 2160 of our trek. The purpose of Wisdom Trek is to create a legacy of wisdom, to seek out discernment and insights, and to boldly grow where few have chosen to grow before. Today we continue with our extended series of messages that I delivered at Putnam Congregational Church over the past couple of years. This message is week 28 of a 43-week series about the good news according to John the Apostle. John has a unique style and narrative as we walk with him through the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. I pray that it will be a conduit of learning and encouragement for you. And I do thank you, each one of you, for being here. It's a blessing to be able to minister at Putnam and to count each of you as my friend. Today we continue our series on the good news according to John the Apostle. And last week we were at the Passover meal and it was just concluding. And Christ reminded those 11 remaining disciples after Judas left to betray Jesus that he would soon be leaving them. And with this in mind, he issued them a new command in verses 34 and 35 last week. It says, a new command I give you, love one another. As, you, as I have loved you, you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The truth was finally setting in with the disciples who were anxious about their future. After all, they invested three and a half years with the rabbi, their teacher, and they had hoped that he would be the Messiah, the coming Messiah who would rule and reign over Israel. And of course, they were hoping that they would have a prominent position within that Messiah's court. Their minds now have been blown and their hearts have been crushed. In today's scriptures, John chapter 14, verses 1 through 24, and it starts on page 1675 in the Pew Bible. And we'll see today as Jesus provides tranquil words for troubled hearts. So follow along as I read it. It's a rather lengthy pack passage. And some of the words are, as I have read through it, difficult to read through the way it's worded. But follow along with me. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If it were not so... Would I have told you where I am going to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the father and that'll be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been with among you so, for such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the father. How can you say, show us the father? Don't you believe that I am that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me anything, you may ask anything in my name, and I will do it. If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives in you and will be in be will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you will also live. On that day, you will realize that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The ones who love me will love, be loved by the Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, 
Why do you intend to show yourself to us and not the world? Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and I will come to them and make my home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words that you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. Now, this particular passage is good for those who are struggling in their hearts, who have heart trouble. I don't mean the type of heart trouble that can be corrected with a nitroglycerin pill or bypass surgery. In some ways, that kind of heart trouble would be easier to cure. I'm referring to the kind of heart trouble that induces stress in your life and crushes or destroys joy. The kind that steals your sleep at night and keeps your mind churning during the day. Some call it worry. But we as Christians, we have more acceptable terms for that, such as concern or interest or lack of peace. Or maybe my favorite one is my burden. To be burdened over some situation which we have no control over is much more spiritually sounding than saying, I'm worried sick. I think we all fall prey to that. The disciples were stunned to hear Jesus' announcement in John chapter 13, verse 33, when he told them, Dear children, I will be with you only a little longer. As I told the Jewish leaders, you will search for me, but you can't come where I am going. In a few minute, moments before that, he said, the troubled master said and exclaimed in verse 21, I tell you the truth, one of you is going to betray me. Only John possibly suspected that that was Judas, that he was the culprit. None of the others knew, and John may not even grasp the truth. The others undoubtedly wondered, have we caused such an offense to our Lord, our rabbi, that he's separating himself from us? Peter protested that the Lord need to withdraw from all the other disciples, and he alone would be with Christ and protect him. Declaring himself loyal unto death, which prompted the prediction that he would deny his master three times before the next morning. Obviously, Jesus didn't mean that he must leave them behind because some or all of them would be disloyal. Nevertheless, the disconnect between his perspective and the disciples was somewhat dramatic. Despite Jesus' many predictions of concerning his death, his burial, his resurrection, which he termed glory or to be glorified, the men that night felt abandoned by him, perhaps even resigned to the fact that he would cease caring for them. The rabbi, they thought in their mind, was rejecting his students like they didn't measure up. They failed in school. And this prompted Jesus, the reassurance that we find in these 24 verses today. Their separation had nothing to do with the disciples' behavior. The Lord was leaving as part of God's plan to redeem the entire world. This plan was established before time ever began, but the disciples could not grasp it, at least at this point. Furthermore, Christ will be faithful to his followers, including us, regardless of our success or failure as disciples. Now, if you look in your bulletin insert today, the side with the green picture on it, the verse there, John 14, 6, Today, we're going to, with these remaining 11 disciples, look at six truths that offer peace for our troubled hearts. That first truth is personal faith in a personal Lord brings personal relief, and that's verse 1. The Lord's exhortation, do not let your hearts be troubled, was the same Greek term that he used when he was agitated or irritated in the spirit when he said, one of you will betray me. It's that same Greek word that he used there. And if Christ said, do not let your hearts be troubled, was he being hypocritical here? No. If we think that, fail to understand the context of what Jesus was meaning in this verse. Jesus does not condemn worry per se, and neither does the Bible overall. Feelings of distress are, distress are common among humanity. The Lord shared with us, and that even in that human nature that he took on himself, what he meant in this verse is, do not let your hearts be troubled by my going away. 
Don't let that disturb your peace because you don't understand right now. You will understand. He, follow, he followed it with a second or, exhortation to believe in the Son of God. He said, you believe in God, believe also in me. The imperfect tense there in the Greek, which our English language doesn't really bring out, implies to keep on believing. It's not a one-time belief. To keep on, on a continual basis of believing. To believe in someone is to rely upon or trust in that person. In the case of God, we are encouraged to trust in him and his ability and willingness to care for us. Let's face it, when something terrible occurs in our lives, we as humanity look heavenward, and we usually have one of two responses. We'll say, why, God, did you allow this to happen? Or we'll say, where was God in this tragedy? Both suggest that the Lord was either unwilling or unable to prevent this tragedy. When pressed by worldly affliction, we naturally wonder, has God abandoned us? And we doubt his goodness and power. But Jesus asks the followers to trust in him, as he does us, in the middle of our confusion. The confusion isn't on God's part. It's on our part. That takes us to the second truth in verses 2 and 3. Our long-term future is secure. Jesus reassured his disciples that going away had nothing to do with their past, present, or future failures. His purpose for going away was to secure their eternal destiny. Now, the metaphor about dwelling in many rooms refers to going to the cross on our behalf, on the behalf of all humanity to ensure that they would have an opportunity for eternal life for anyone who would believe. He declared that his leaving was necessary, but his return was just as sure. Now, the phrase on house of many rooms as it's translated in the New, New International Version. In the older translation, some of them said mansions, inspiring a dream of having this heavenly castle-like estate in heaven. Instead, what we were doing there was transferring our frustrated materialism into a spiritual realm. We as humans are very good at that. However, the Greek term here is monei, and it's the plural noun based on the verb mino, which means a place to abide or a place to remain. The verb will later be central to Jesus' teaching and his exhortation as we look at chapter 15 in a few weeks. Now, Jesus used this metaphor many rooms to illustrate a future relationship that we'll have with the Father. And it doesn't really have anything to do with heavenly real estate. The ancient Near Eastern culture, and we don't understand that culture, and by not doing so, we don't understand what Jesus was really meaning here. In the ancient Near Eastern culture, once the groom was betrothed, and we talked about this earlier in John, once they were engaged in, in our terminology, then they went away from the, each other for a period of time. And the purpose for that separation was so that the groom could build an extra room on the family estate. When they came back together to be married, he would take his bride after the wedding ceremonies and festivals, he would take his bride to that room so that they could dwell there as a family unit. And this is what Jesus is talking about. When he goes away, he's going away for a specific purpose to build those rooms for us. So when he, the bride of Christ, comes back, or Jesus comes back for the bride of Christ and takes us to our heavenly realm, He's already prepared that room for us, that we can dwell and remain in that room. He takes us to the integral part of the family estate. Jesus' promise to come back refers not only to his resurrection, but more importantly to that second coming, where he'll return a second time to establish that global Eden where heaven and earth eventually will become one and will have passage between the two. And this is what Jesus was referring to when he refers to many rooms. Jesus, as we go on to verses 4 through 7, reminded his disciples that they knew the way to heaven, although undoubtedly they failed to understand it that night, that heaven was even the subject of his, his discussion here. Much of what he said in that upper room that night was it became apparent 
when they received that indwelling Holy Spirit at Pentecost. All of a sudden, it says their eyes were open. He opened their minds and they understood those truths that they didn't understand that night. However, the way Jesus would travel would not be the way that the disciples or us would take. That's what he said. You cannot come the way I'm going because the way Jesus Christ went was through the Garden of Gethsemane, through the trials, through the scourging, through the cross, through death, burial, resurrection, and his ascension. That is not the same path that we will take. And that's what he was trying to get to across to his disciples. In response to Thomas's question, which was obviously based on the literal interpretation of Jesus's words, Jesus declared himself to be that path or that stairway to heaven. In calling himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus united three predominant themes that John had taken care, much care to weave through his entire narrative. The images of light, which is truth, of water, which is life, can seen, be seen in virtually every story leading up to the Last Supper. And these are joined with that first image that Christ proclaimed in John chapter 1, verse 51, where he says that he was becoming the way of people to enter heaven. And verse 6 declares a cardinal truth of the gospel. And then verse 7 was somewhat of a rebuke. And this was not a new teaching for the disciples. The disciples have been watching and listening for Jesus till Jesus for more than three years. Yet some of the followers outside the 12 disciples understood much better than the disciples did. So he was not teaching necessarily a new truth, but he was trying to get across to them once again what he meant. And that takes us to the third truth. The sovereign hand of God is at work in each believer's life. Verses 8 through 11. Jesus' response to Thomas was then challenged by Philip and is commonly expressed by every one of us. We live under the illusion that the will of God would be easier for us to accept if God would just show up in person and tell us what he really wanted or what he, want, what he meant. Suffering would be so much more bearable and easy to follow if we were audibly communicated with. If we just received some sort of personal visitation. However, we do not fear or fail merely because of our doubt. We fail because we have a sinful nature inside us that enslaves us to sin, as we're told in Romans chapter 7. And it prevents us from understanding God's word if we allow sin to reside in our lives. When Jesus reminded Philip and the others, the perfect representation of the Father was Jesus Christ. They didn't need anyone else. If you saw the F Jesus, you saw the Father because they were of one essence. They were one being. Everything the Son says does reflect what the Father says in word and deed. Therefore, everything Jesus said and did in that upper room was in obedience to the sovereignty, the sovereign plan of God, which takes us to the fourth truth in verses 12 through 14. Greater results occur when we pray in Jesus' name and for the Father's glory. Verse 12 establishes the context. When Christ goes to the Father, his disciples are to step into the spiritual vacuum that he leaves behind. Those who believe will pick up where Jesus left off and not only do what Jesus did, but do something much greater. The ministry will expand. Jesus, when he remained on earth, could only be in one location at, at a time. But with him leaving, his kingdom could be spread throughout the entire world. Those who believe will pick up where he left off. And verse 13 flows right out of verse 12. Jesus declares that the prayers offered to continue the son's ministry will be answered as if he had spoken that prayer himself. Verse 14 clarifies the underlying and condition of that promise. To speak and act in someone's name is to act on their behalf in pursuit of their best interest. Think of it being a power of attorney for, say, an elderly parent. You are to speak and act on their behalf for their best interest. And Jesus is saying, when you pray in the name of the Father, you speak and act on my behalf for my best interest. And that's the analogy or the word picture that we can use here. In other words, the Lord will grant requests that are contradictory as to his nature or oppose his plan. We so often get confused in saying, well, if we pray to the Father, he'll give us anything we want. No. 
He's saying, when you speak and act on my behalf for my best interest, then I will grant you your prayer request. More often than not, we do not pray in the interest of Jesus and the plans for God's glory. Instead, in our immaturity, we seek our own interest on what will improve our personal situations. Then as we grow wiser in grace and maybe more, more robust in our faith, we learn to ask for what is good. However, we still struggle on what is really good. However, I recall even in my own prayer request, that I thought I prayed what was earnest and noble and hopefully unselfish prayers to God. Only after the fact, I could step back and say, boy, I'm sure glad you didn't answer that request because it was not in my best interest and it was not in the Father's best interest. I prayed with limited knowledge and sometimes maybe with a hint of presumption, thinking that I knew my, what was best for me better than God knew. Jesus promises us that we, as we discover the will of God and align our prayers with the prayers that Jesus Christ mentioned here to fulfill his purpose, our prayers will become as powerful as Jesus' prayers. To think of that, that our prayers could be anywhere close to be as powerful as Jesus's. But that's what he's promising us in this. If our prayers align with Jesus Christ to further God's glory. Then our fifth truth in verses 15 through 17, we are not alone. We have been given an indwelling helper. Jesus established an unbreakable connection between the love of God and the obedience to his command. Whereas Peter wanted to express his love in a blaze of glory, wielding a sword and standing beside Jesus at his last stand, his master asked for something far more complicated than that, Daily, consistent obedience. However, the Lord knows the human heart. And we are woefully incapable of obedience on our own. An impartial fulfillment of that covenant promise in Jeremiah and 2 Corinthians and Ephesians, Jesus promised that Holy Spirit that he would come and dwell within our hearts if we believe. Now, the news of this Holy Spirit should have stunned the 11 men that night because they knew the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was a rare gift and was almost always a temporary gift for the saints of the Old Testament. He came upon a certain individual for a brief period of time for a specific purpose, and then it departed. Because few individuals up to this point were granted the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit's life among them was John the Baptizer, which John Cooch will speak of in a couple weeks. In Luke chapter 1, verse 15, that Holy Spirit indwelt him from the womb in his entire life. So the announcement of each of them, realizing that the Holy Spirit would come and inhabit them, should have been excellent news to them. Jesus was talking in this next passage about two things. His own and this world. The Holy Spirit comes as a dramatic shift in Jesus' view on the relationship between these two. The believers represented by his own and the world represented by those who refuse to accept Christ. They included, initially it included all humanity was included in this. It wasn't quite as specific earlier in John's gospel in his narrative. As the narrative unfolds, though, we see a gradual differentiation between his own and the world. They begin to separate between the two. They remain somewhat intertwined because we're still part of creation, part of humanity as, as a whole. Yet has fallen away. We've, the more we turn to Christ, the more we'll look like the world, the more we'll be separated from the world. But that's not complete separation because Jesus acknowledges that his own will be in the world. We're not to separate ourselves completely, but we're not of the world. That means we don't take on the world's concepts and the world's standard of living. As the promised Holy Spirit, Jesus portrayed that his own, those believers in the world, will become mortal enemies, separating farther and farther between the two. From this point forward, the believers 
are associated with God, and the world opposes God, and the believers who represent him. And our sixth truth tonight, today is, in verses 18 through 21, we are inseparably linked to Christ. Jesus' promise to return involves a twofold prediction. He will return through his resurrection, and the disciples would see him, and many people would see him, but not the world. However, his resurrection makes it only possible for our resurrection as believers. We will also see him when we have eternal life after death. In the meantime, he says, we are not, I will not leave you as orphans because he is still present through the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. Jesus as the Son and the Father are two persons, but they're one in essence. So the Son and the Spirit are two persons, but one in essence. And we have that essence living in us as believers. We have that same essence of Jesus Christ. When Jesus can no longer be seen physically in this world, believers will continue to see him because we've been given spiritual sight. The presence of the Holy Spirit is how that promise is fulfilled, while obedience is the method or the means how it will be fulfilled. As we grow in obedience, our relationship with him will be strengthened. As a result, we will see him, not physically, until his return in that last day, but spiritually. And then we move on to the last three verses. Judas, not the traitor, but their disciple, asked the question that gave the Lord another opportunity to emphasize the distinction between his own and the world. Instead, he reworded it. His earlier statement that means of seeing is through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives us sight. The method by which we receive that Holy Spirit is our obedience to Christ through salvation. Those who do not believe are like people who are born without eyes. They don't have the mechanism to even see. And even if they have some spiritual nature, if they refuse to open their eyes and they keep them closed, they're no different than somebody born without they choose not to see. They refuse to open through obedience in Christ. Jesus used this fictive language to unite, unite several concepts. The concept of obedience, love, the word of Christ, seeing Christ, abiding with Christ. All these facets have the same positive response to God, and all are made possible when we become his own. And we have the indwelling Holy Spirit. We have to take advantage of the history that we could see these disciples at night and say, hey, chill out, hang loose. It's not as bad as it seems at night because we can see it through divine perspective, knowing what happens to the disciples after this. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us whether those who have gone to heaven can, can view what's happening on earth. It doesn't say one way or another. But just as, for instance, if they can see what's going on on earth, they would say to us, hang loose, chill. God is working it all out because they would see us in our struggles from a divine perspective. If only we could see from that perspective. But according to Jesus, we can. So what's the application here tonight, today on these verses? And that's on the other side of your bulletin insert, medicine for the and based on the study of John chapter 13, verses 33 through 38, I found three sources of heart trouble that affected the disciples and continues to plague the believers today. Jesus addressed these all in chapter 14. Heart trouble number one, we fear because death is near. The Son of God faced imminent death, and the disciples naturally wondered, if Jesus was not going to escape this demise, how are we possibly going to escape it? Death is the ultimate fear for most people. However, we're also deathly afraid of disease, sickness, accidents, crime, war, poverty, and a host of all other mortal afflictions. We fear death for ourselves or we fear death for our loved ones that they might be taken prematurely in death. Heart trouble number two is daily problems that we have. The disciples wondered, how are we going to handle life without Jesus? We've just invested three and a half years with our rabbi, and now he's skipping out on us. Well, each day, we roll out of bed, we enter our daily life, and we realize we risk damaging something valuable, suffering something painful, 
hurting or losing someone that we love dearly or failing in some sort of important task. As a result, people experience pressures from job loss, suffering pain, enduring hardships. We feel rejected. We might face bankruptcy. We might fall ill. And sometimes those problems of our daily life feel overwhelming to us. The third heart trouble is disobedience. And this is where Jesus in verse 38 last week said, love one another. And, and Peter hopped up and says, I'll fight for you. Now, that's not what I said, Peter. I said, love one another. And because we are fundamentally sinful from birth and we will never live a sinless life in this world because we'll be continually battle the consequences of our disobedience. We'll have guilt and shame, regret, remorse, self-condemnation, fear of discovery, people finding out who we really are, dread of repentance, avoidance of responsibility. Oh, how exhausting to walk around with unresolved sin hanging from our hearts. It's like a huge stone that weighs us down. Yes, death does produce fear. Daily problems do cause anxiety. Disobedience does generate shame. Every day of our existence, we run that gauntlet of fear and anxiety and shame and a full range of emotions and of humanity. But we fail to realize sometimes that Jesus, though sinless in his life, was genuinely human. Therefore, we experience, he experienced the same range of emotions that we do, and yet without sin. So now we have a high priest who ministers with complete understanding of how we feel. It's not that Jesus can't understand. He does. He empathizes with us. Just before leaving the earth to go to heaven, he gave his disciples these six truths that we've gone over today to help them to bear their struggles and to give them a little hope in life. And with these three heart troubles, I want to offer three practical lessons to counter the deadly effects of this heart trouble. Technique number one, to dispel fear, we must meditate on, on truth. For believers, fear is the result of ignorance. People who are afraid of God just do not know Christ. People who fear the future don't know what God's word has to say about our future. People who dread judgment for sin do not know the good news of Jesus Christ that John wrote about, and so did Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The people are terrified to death, of, if, and people are, that are terrified of death do not know the Lord's promises. On the other hand, Christians, we as believers, have no reason to fear anything, including death. Granted, none of us look forward to dying, and all of us will do what we can to prolong our life for as long as we can, but death loses its power to frighten us because Christ has overcome death. Divine truth dispels fear. Technique number two, to reduce anxiety, we need to allow the truth to guide every decision. Jesus did not bring us truth to earth merely for our sake of education. He expects us to absorb the truth like a sponge will absorb water and then apply that truth to our lives. When we do that, we'll conform to his ways. Anxiety will fade from our lives when we know that we're living in harmony with God and his will. Meditate on the truths of God's word as Jesus articulated in that upper room and we'll discover new ways to apply each of those truths to our lives. And then the third technique, to release shame in our lives, we need to choose to love Christ and serve his body. Shame is self-condemnation, a self-centered pattern of thought that's inappropriate once we've repented from our sins and accepted Christ. And Christ has removed all that guilt. If we remember in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, it says, Now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. However, we continue to struggle at times with guilt because we choose to continue in disobedience. Many others, people might suffer with shame because they remain self-focused. Well, the solution is laid out here. Turn one's attention outward, choosing to love and serve Christ by loving and serving one another. We do that pretty well, Putnam, from my perspective. But let us look for ways where we can love and help one another. And this is what Jesus is telling us in these six truths today. That he's given us everything we need. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And that sums up 
these verses. We know that Jesus Christ, as the verse on the other side says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And once we do that, we'll have that indwelling Holy Spirit that we can see spiritually with spiritual eyes of what Christ wanted us to learn. I'll thank you in advance, John and John, for the next couple of weeks speaking in my absence. I look forward to watching the messages online. And when I get back, we'll pick up where we left off this morning, talk more about the Holy Spirit, and we'll learn about overcoming fear. So I'd ask you to please read John chapter 14, verses 25 through 31 in preparation for that message. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much that our hearts do not need to be troubled because we believe in you, that you are the way, the truth, and the life, that no one comes to the Father but through you, and we have spiritual eyes that can see through the Holy Spirit giving us sight. We thank you for all of this, and we praise your name. We pray, Father, that you will work on each of our hearts and our lives, that we might look outward to share with others, to help others, to encourage others, Father, that in all ways, your name might be glorified. We pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I pray that this message was a blessing and a time of learning from God's Word. Thank you so much for allowing me to be your guide, your mentor, but most importantly, I am your friend as I serve you through the Wisdom Trek Podcast and Journal each day. And as we take this trek of life together, let us always live abundantly. Love unconditionally, listen intentionally, learn continuously, lend to others generously, lead with integrity, and leave a living legacy each day. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, reminding you to keep moving forward, enjoy your journey, and create a great day every day. See you next time for more wisdom from God's Word.